Hey guys, JJ here, back again with another Saturday Zoom Networking. Have an absolutely awesome guest speaker for you today. Young man out of Pace Morby Sub 2 community. Talking about Pace all the time, premier genius in creative finance in the country, which means in the world today. Pace and Step 2 community is by far today the premier real estate education platform with everything they have to offer going on today. Our guest speaker is one of the rock stars, highly recognized, highly respected in Sub 2. Uh, like the rest of us, started as a student, became an entrepreneur, now a very successful investor who is helping others, coaching, um, just an absolute whiz and a heck of a nice guy, my good friend, Jeff Smith. Jeff, how are you doing today, brother? Man, I'm doing good. Thanks for bringing me on. Looking forward to hanging out with you guys. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's just, uh, you know, love to talk the other day. You have such a great personality. Um I talk about it all the time that if we're going to do business, we're going to network. We, the benefit is finding people that we like, people that resonate with us. And uh, for me, you're one of those guys. Hey, um, for those who don't know you, where in the country are you located? So I'm located in Houston, Texas, and that is really the market we focus on as well. Awesome. Awesome, brother. Hey, really quick, what did you do before you became an investor? Were you, were you Was real estate on the landscape? Were you doing something else? Was dad a contractor, mom an agent? What, how, what was your transition from your teens into 20s into real estate? Yeah. So when I got out of school, I went to engineering school at Clemson University in South Carolina. Go Tigers. Go Tigers. Go, go Tigers. And I got it, my foot in the door at the last second, right as the 2008 financial issues were happening. I was walking away with a master's degree and the engineering company out of Charleston, South Carolina was not hiring um, at that time which was my whole plan. This is why I pursued this, the pursue the master degree. Like I had the whole thing set. So now 2008 starting to happen. And so I get my foot in the door at the last second with an oil and gas company out of Houston, Texas. And I said, okay, like I'm going to make a tough decision. We're going to move, you know, across the universe as it felt to me at the time, like who the hell would go that far away. So find myself in Texas and I, I'm going around between different sites. So I'm being rotated between the engineering office, the metal fabrication shop and construction, all the things. Eventually find my way to the Middle East for three years. I'm working in Saudi Arabia. Wow. Come back from this experience. I've got a nice, you know, treasure chest of cash because that's the only way I can get anybody to go out over there is pay them a lot of money. <laughs> and I plug in with the uh, Houston based in oil and gas. It's not so much sales when you're in a contractor position. You're more receiving requests for proposals. And then you're helping manage the, the estimating team and writing the proposal to send back. Here's what we're going to build. And here's how much it costs. You do this. We do this. So I was doing major contract negotiations, like nine-digit deals. These, these were big. And while this is going on, there's a part of me that says, you know, I have more in the tank. There's, I know I can be doing additional stuff to grow my wealth. And at the same time, I'm starting to realize, even though... I'm really good at what I do. I still remember 2008. Like, this is like seven years later. Like I still remember 2008. And at the drop of a hat, you might not have that W-2 income anymore. No one is actually safe. They're not. And so I start to plug away and research, well, what can I do? And I tinkered around with a few things and then found the idea of rental properties. And then I started to explore that some more and it kind of grew from there. We met through sub two. We actually, you know, met at Squat Up Summit and got to reconnect face to face. But how did you get into Sub Two? How did you come across Pace? Was it a TV commercial? Was it online advertisement? Somebody whispering in your ear? Yeah, the first time I ran into Pace, there was an event in Houston. I think it was 2019. It was called Whole Scaling. I wasn't full time into it; still just kind of playing around. And they had brought in tons of speakers, all the names you'd probably recognize. 75% of them. And Pace was one of those speakers before Sub2 was created. And I remember him talking on that stage. And I thought, when that guy shows up ever with an education program or something, I want to be a part of that. And so it obviously would be only a couple of years later until Sub2 came about. But what really happened is that I was in another community with Steve Trang, his group is called Real Estate Disruptors. They do some basic sales training. Good stuff. Nothing bad to say about Steve at all. And I'll tell you why I joined Steve's program in a minute. 
But while I was in that program, that's about the time Pace started to come on the scene. And about seven, eight months after he had been going, we were hearing rumblings like this community is amazing. And we realized at the time also sub two was not the end all be all of everything real estate. It really was if you're doing cash wholesaling or you're doing fix and flip. Awesome. Here's how you level up and bring creative finance into the tool belt. And so that's where we decided to plug into sub two. And basically since that time, about three and a half years ago, I've been pretty committed to being, you know, a, a part of that group and making it my, my real estate investor home, if you will. Of course you had met pace on a couple of occasions. Um, I know we were both down in, in uh, Orlando recently where he had the squad up summit. Um, just a, a wonderful young man, Pace Morby. I can say that because I'm I'm 112 right now. Actually, I look good for my age. You look good for 112. Yeah, I'm 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 hanging in there. Uh, yeah, Pace is just a great guy with a great message, uh, huge heart, helping everybody. And I think you know uh, not only his community but everyone with a near shot of him is very fortunate to hear what he has to share. Um, hey, so your uh, your topic today is why sales and negotiation should be the number one skill you master. You know, I've heard before people talk about sales and negotiation, and most people are like, what is that? So why don't you kind of introduce us, uh, you know, for those that aren't aware of what it is and how it relates, um, I'll just say, take it away, brother. Okay. There is a reason that I am so crazy about this particular message. When I first, when I was getting started, I had a cold caller and we were chasing down probates and vacancies and absentee landlords, all things, right? There came a point, this is the origin story. We called on this probate lead. Guy says, I want to sell the house. I inherited it. It's been in the family for who knows, like 60 years, 80 years, tons of time. We need to sell it. All these other wholesalers are lowballing me. I want 180 grand for it. All these wholesalers, they have no idea. They're offering me like 90 and he's already frustrated, right? Sounds like the epitome of I'll sell for the right price, right? Well, I took a look at this thing and I realized, man, I know why the wholesalers are struggling here. No, nobody's flipping houses around here. And I nearly gave up on this lead until I remembered something that I had been taught at a seminar I'd been to about sometimes land has value to builders. Sometimes they have value to developers, depending on how big the land was. This was a house on a one acre lot, which is not particularly large, but I looked at the map and I'll be darned if there's not a developer making 14 houses on a single acre, which is like a par five away. So, huh? So I call up one of the, and there's three of them. So I call up the first guy. Hey, are you interested in buying? He said, no, nah, man, we're, we're kind of done there. Okay. Call up the second guy. Are you interested? No, nah, man, we're, we've, we've moved on. Call up the third guy. He said, we would absolutely love to build in this area. What do you got? Now, most of the time as wholesalers, we're a little paranoid about sharing addresses to buyers before we have it under contract. But basically what I told this guy was, hey, look, it's a one acre lot. It's not far away from you. Out of respect, I don't want to give you the address because this family could wake up tomorrow and decide they don't want to sell. It wasn't true, but it was just the excuse I used. I said, listen, I just need some guidance on where this needs to land. And I'll bring it to you first and give you the first look if you would help me in that way. And he said, okay, well, just kind of rule of thumb, I would buy for $7 an acre if I'm able to build out the land. I said, okay, great. Um, I'll, I'll call you back later when you know I kind of figure out where they're at. He said, cool. And anybody in our studio audience type in the chat, how many square feet per acre? 43,560 square feet per acre. Multiply by seven. Oh my God, this guy just offered me $325,000 for one acre and the seller's asking 180. Call the seller back. And I'm a little shaky now. Hey man, um, I, I feel like I'm making some progress here. Um, I just noticed that the acre to the north of you, that this probably has no uh, bearing here, but it also has the same last name. Do you know who that is by chance? Oh, yeah, that's my cousin, and he wants to sell for 180. I'll call you back. Hey, Daniel, um, 
would you want to take on two acres instead of one? Hell yeah, I'd take on two acres. Same price, $7 square foot, 100% I'll do it. Guys, I am staring down the barrel of a $200,000 assignment fee. And I have no idea what to do next. It should be as simple as go make an offer. But how many of you have even thrown out a number and you never hear from the seller again? Or at worst, they just take your number, shop it to the next guy, and all he's got to do is bid you up five grand and you've lost the whole thing. How many of you have experienced this at one point or another? Oh, yeah. I am terrified that this is about to happen. Not to mention, I frankly don't believe any of this. <laughs> I don't believe the developer actually is going to pay me this much, and I can't believe the seller is willing to part for it. Like none of this. And I am just having a mental breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of these life changing deals. And at this moment, I said, if I don't understand sales and how to be in control of the situation, because I have to close the seller, but now I have to close the buyer also, we forget selling on the dispo side, it's still a sales and negotiating process. And I have no idea how to do this successfully without just losing everything, just the whole thing falling apart. That's why I scrambled. And then Steve Trang was at the whole scaling event. And so I called him up it's like, dude, I, I need help like right now. This is a life changing deal. And so I got what I needed from his program, which is basically like his you know, his methodology to offer and like scrambled, studied like crazy. And about 30 days later, I had the contracts from both of them. Seven months later, we closed it. Wow. Made $200,000 off of that deal. Now I didn't get, now what I realized in this whole thing, as I'm going through this, I said one, okay, better lucky than good. And luck is where opportunity meets preparation. Okay, fair enough. But what I didn't like about this entire thing, everyone, is I felt out of control the entire time. I didn't know what questions to ask to drive this thing forward. And I felt powerless at the very end. Because even at the very end, and I did this a sloppy way, I said, here's my price for one acre. If you rope in your cousin, I'll basically bump you up another 10 grand. Please, oh, please don't tell the other wholesaler what I told you. And thank God the other wholesaler never actually called back. The other wholesaler had just didn't know what to do. So he just flaked on the whole thing, right? So just anyway, after that, I just said, never again will I not know what to do. Mm -hmm. I may not be able to get the deal. That's not what I'm talking about. But I will know how to ask the right questions because my script sucks. And I will have the control to close these people. And so yeah. I studied like a crazy person and finally... Uh, you know, made a compilation of all the all the things that I learned, and that's what I've been coaching since then. So wow. that is why I got so crazy about learning this and getting really good at it for when the next opportunity shows up. Oh, yeah, you know, it's so important. You know, we talk about real estate transactions and buying and selling and dealing with not thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and ideally, as we grow, millions of dollars. Um, Anything that we do of that nature, it's a matter really of, of being prepared. You know, I used to, I, I boxed competitively for a long time, and and in in boxing, you spar, you prepare for what someone's going to do, so you know how to react. And if you prepare properly, you're three steps in front of your opponent because you've anticipated, you know, every objection that they might have. And so, as you're teaching people to do. You know, preparing for the objections, preparing for the questions, preparing for, you know, the answers that that one who's not prepared would would encounter. Then you're more qualified, more prepared to move forward and obtain the answers that we want to get. So, um, I think what you're what you're teaching is is invaluable. Um, we'll get to. I was going to get to it later. But let's talk about it now. So you're you're actually got a coaching program now? Yeah, so it's exclusively for like real estate sales negotiation. Cool. Because the way I figure it like real estate strategies, acquisition, dispo, land, multifamily, commercial, whatever it is, like these things come and go constantly. What never really changes that much is that you still have to have the ability to communicate and negotiate. You have to be, here's the way I talk about it, because I think a lot of people get into real estate investing, one, because they want to make a portfolio for their future. Like, let's not lie about this. We're here to make a bunch of money. Fair enough. 
we're also here to take care of our families, of course. There's a lot of people who get in it because they genuinely want to help people. They do mean that, right? I'm going to help people who are in foreclosure. It's not bad that I get paid for it. Okay, fair enough. And then what do we do? We just hand them a script and say, go have fun. Just follow the script. Well, the problem is the seller doesn't get a copy of that script, do they? We start talking to them. They're like, that's not what you're supposed to say. You're supposed to say that that's not your lines, right? If they were out in L.A. with you, JJ, they'd be thrown off the Hollywood studios immediately. Like, you all yeah. are terrible at this. You're going off script, brother. You're going off script. What's the matter with you? And, of course, you say this on the phone. And the seller's like, I don't understand. Right? It just all falls apart. And so... The way I teach people is I say, guys, the question, like, look, the questions you're asking suck. So here's, here's a new thought. Who is the most, who is the most universally disliked salespeople out there? Right, wrong, and different. Who is the most universally disliked salespeople out there? Car salesmen. That's the first thing that everybody comes to mind. Why do we not like car salesmen? What is it about them? The reason we don't like car salesmen is that we feel that they're not really that interested in helping us find a car as much as they're interested in just getting us in a car as fast as they can and getting their commission. Mm -hmm. They don't actually care what we're trying to accomplish. We feel like they're being pushy and we feel like they're they're just not paying attention to us. That's what we feel. Okay. Now, on the flip side of that coin, who are the most universally respected salespeople out there? The salespeople you go to and you just can't wait to pay for them. Who is that? Doctors. Doctors are the most universally respected salespeople. What do they do? They diagnose problems and they use their wisdom and experience to write you a prescription and a treatment plan and you pay them for that service. And you are happy to do it. Right? So how do we become real estate doctors. That is the message that I'm trying to communicate in sales. No matter what industry you're in, W2 right now, it doesn't matter. Everything is some element of communication and saying, what is the problem you are experiencing that I can solve? What are you concerned about that is could potentially happen? What is the thing that you dislike about your past situation? Think about it this way. When you go into that doctor's office, what is the first question the doctor asks? What seems to be the problem today? And instead, as real estate investors, when we get started, we do stupid things like, how many beds and baths are there? How many square feet is the house? How old is the roof? How old is the water heater? When was the last time you replaced the kitchen? This is akin to going to that doctor's office and you remember you get that sheet of paper that the nurses give you. Mm. What's your height? What's your weight? Are you, you know, are you pregnant? Could you become what medications are you on? What diseases do you have? Do you have a family history? And you go, oh my God, what does this have to do with this bone sticking out of my arm that I just broke when I did a backflip off of my Harley? None of this has any, it doesn't matter how tall I am if my arm is broken. And yet we got to fill out the stupid thing. We get frustrated at these fact-finding trivia questions. We should not be surprised when property owners feel the same way. How do we fix this? We ask the hard questions, the diagnostic questions, the way doctors do. What seems to be the problem today? What has you thinking about selling in the first place? What even has you interested? Tell me where this is bothering you the most. Tell me what it is about this house that is your biggest concern. What is the thing about this situation that's really getting under your skin that I can help with? Where else is this affecting you in your life? Who else needs to be involved in this conversation with the house? What other things do you feel could stop this from being sold? What is the thing that you're most dissatisfied about in your world right now? And so what I hope everyone is hearing is the questions we're asking are not trivia. They're not factual. Because regardless if I ask you how many beds there are, if I ask you, if I ask JJ, if I ask me, if I ask Zillow, I'm getting the same answer, right? But if I flip it and say, are you concerned about the number of bedrooms in the house? I can get very different answers. Well, yeah, I don't like having two bedrooms because I have a growing family. This doesn't work for me anymore. Very different response. And so that's what I'm 
coaching people on how to do. How do you ask these questions so that somebody starts to give you the problems, the things they don't like, and now you can do something about it and help them? Let me give you one example in particular of how how this can work, okay? Imagine for a second that we were selling home security systems. Some of you have heard me do this example before. Listen to these three questions and how different the results are in a very slight change. Is the security system affecting your bottom line? How much is the security system impacting your bottom line? Are you concerned about the security system impacting your bottom line? Very slight changes, but we all hear that we're going to get very different answers. Is it impacting you? Oh, yeah, it impacts me. No question about it. How much is it impacting you? You know, 50, 70 bucks a month, something like that. Are you concerned it's impact? No, man, it's the best 50, 70 bucks I ever spent. Okay, well, then they're not calling us because of the cost. They're calling us about something else. Most of us get hell bent that because there is an impact that somehow that's the problem. I just showed you an example where it's not. We have to learn to understand to go after the things they're worried about they don't like. That's how you find motivation. That's awesome, brother. As you say, it's about diagnosing the situation. We we talk about it all the time. We, you know, <clears throat> what is the seller's why? Why why are they selling? You know, is it is it death in the family? Is it economic uh, distress? Is it uh, you know moving to be near grandkids? A variety of things. Uh, Jeff, we got a question coming in from the audience, so I'm going to bring somebody in here. Jeff, we have Rick, don't call me Richard Strickland with us from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Hey, Rick, what's going on, brother? How you doing? Everything you just spoke on applied to me yesterday, but it wasn't a house. And I learned it from watching Pace, find the bunnies, find the paying points. Well, I'll give you a brief, uh, brief background. JJ knows it, most of them. So two things helped me yesterday. One is integrity. I don't have any credit. I've always paid cash for everything. I got cash only tattooed on my forearm. I don't believe in credit. I'm working on that. But I saw this truck I wanted. So I stopped. I know the owner. He owns the shop. And I asked him how much he wanted. He wanted $82.50 for it. I said, what's your motivation for selling this? Well, I bought it for my 17-year-old employee. I put seven down and I put another twelve fifty in it, and then he quit because he was irresponsible. That's his pain point. Well, Richard has no credit, but I got integrity and I got a good business relationship with my rep. Hey, Mr. Michael, look, this is Rick. I found an excellent truck. I love it. I need, I need ten k. I need you to spot me. Will you please do it? You know, if not, I got it. I'll just wait. And if it's available, I'll get it. Richard, I'll be there in 20 minutes with the money. My wife's sitting there looking at me like I've lost my mind. Well, then then we got to the notary. In the state of Louisiana, I didn't realize it because I was just going to do a bill of sale, get the title in his name, put in my name. But he's very particular. He's very... OCD, he did not want it in his name. So I put my eight grand up on the table and he said, no, we got to have this. I said, I don't have the money for my tax title and license, right? So this was his other pain point. So what he did is he told his daughter, the daughter was the notary. By the time we got done, I got my truck for 7400 because he paid a tax title and license just to get the title out of his name. But all that was saying, that's just because of negotiations. I, you know, they knew I had integrity. I was trying to help them. They was trying to help me get the truck. And just by simple communication and us each trying to find each other's pain points, like you was talking about, I got a, I got a $9,000 truck for $7,400. I got my plates and I only got to pay, I just got to pay my uh, disability back rep. So negotiations, you know, or anything, anything you learn here is applicable, not only to real estate, but vehicles, businesses. And that's one thing I've learned through this community and also on JJ's networking and watching pace. Yeah, that's a hundred percent true. Like I was talking to some guys the other day and they were, they were talking about, you know, they have some coworkers saying, you know, I need this thing done by such and such a date, or, you know, I'm trying to achieve X 
And they said, well, well, what is the thing that you're thinking could stop you from achieving X? And then finally, they got to the root of the problem that was actually happening. It was never about the date itself. It was this other thing that was happening. So, you know, good job, Rick, that you figured out what the pain point was. And because you could figure it out, you can then push on those buttons and say, I can make this thing go away. Work with me here. And then you figure out what. And then the other thing you figure out, is this somebody I can actually work with? Or is it just somebody who says I'll sell for the right price? And the thing is, too, you know, I learned this from JJ. And I learned it from watching Pace. None of that negotiation was intentional. It's just a relationship we had. We talked as friends. We were all friends. And it's so much easier to negotiate when you have a relationship with somebody instead of just having that hard money mindset of this is business, this is what I'm going to do, this is what I'm not going to do, is then people shut down. That's what I've learned. I've learned a lot of that from being here on JJ's because I met several people. I can't do anything for them, but I'm like a little connector within the group. If I see people and I just put them together because I'm not at the point where I can help them. I appreciate that, you know, because I learned that on my own yesterday. I wish this we'd have had this yesterday, but it came out fine. But yeah, I appreciate this. But so you know. there's there's a point I want to make here. And you're 100% right. When you have a strong relationship with somebody, it makes those conversations <laughs> 10 times easier. It's not even close. But the thing is, a lot of times, if we're meeting sellers for the first time, or if it's somebody who go, is going into foreclosure in a few weeks, for example, how do we build up rapport fast? Because I don't have time to take you out fishing. I don't have time to, to do all these other things. So, guys, what is the major rapport builder? Like when you go into a doctor's office, the doctor doesn't ask you like, hey, let's go out for drinks and then I'll diagnose your problems. Exactly. The way we build rapport a lot of times, guys, is by asking good questions and having genuine care and empathy. When you can put both of these together, you can build your rapport super fast. Sure. But the fact that you had this relationship beforehand, yeah, puts you at a huge advantage. I thank you, uh, Jeff. I just very much appreciate it. All right. You know, the techniques of sales and negotiation, and that's basically learning how to talk to people, but learning how to find their pain, how to find their why. Um, is it pretty much, I mean, does it differ a lot from just land to commercial to multifamily to single family? Are there a lot of similarity from from one aspect to another or... Is it, you know, is it greatly, I mean, I'm sure some questions are going to vary from, from field to field, but yeah. um, is, is, I guess there's some commonality depending upon what field you take it towards, right? Yeah. And, and it's kind of like with, with a lot of principles, like if you study marketing and advertising, if you study sales negotiation, if you study underwriting or any of these other things, what you tend to notice is that the overarching framework of doing it is identical. Right. If you just say underwriting, yeah, there are some specifics of houses and there are specifics of multifamily industry and all the rest of these things. But a lot of the principles flow down the same way. Right. We want to know what the acquisition price is. We want to know how much money it can generate, taxes, all the rest of the things. Right. These are all similar frameworks. In the same way with sales, there are similar frameworks that apply no matter what product you're chasing. It's a matter of planning and preparation and understanding what the issues are they're having. So here's the example. Let's say door number one, we have somebody with a house. And then over here, we have a different industry product, which is land. Okay. So here's what we do when we start playing this out. We go, okay, if somebody is on a probate list, for example, with a house, what are the potential issues that they could be having? Like, I'm just going to guess at it. What could they be experiencing? Well, it could be. I inherited a house and I live out of state. It, like this is a royal pain in the butt to go and, and deal with that. Okay, that could be it. I have two mortgages. One was heavy enough. Now I've inherited a mortgage. I inherited a house and I got the mortgage. Great. I don't want to do that. That's too much for me. It could be the house needs a ton of work. I don't have the money to pay. These are all the potential issues they have. And because like a doctor, when the doctors go to medical school, they study all the diseases and learn all the symptoms. It's the exact same way. Here's all the diseases, if you will, that a probate lead has. Well, what would be the symptoms? Jeff, I'm calling you because I've inherited this house. I live super far away. And so now I want to sell it. Hmm. 
sounds to me like making this trip back and forth could be an issue. I'll dive into that some more. What's another another symptom? Yeah, Jeff, we inherited this house. Um, you know, me and my brother, you know, we're, we're trying to keep up the payments, but we'd really like to sell it fast just so, you know, just so we can get it done. Hmm, I wonder if there's a financial burden of this mortgage. I'm going to dive into that deeper. So by listing out the potential motivations and then you list out the potential symptoms, you're just, again, following the doctor framework and then saying, now, what are the questions I'm going to ask to say, hey, so if you're if you're saying that this house needs to be offloaded proper, promptly, what is coming to your mind that you're concerned about would happen if it doesn't get sold promptly? Well, Jeff, we're worried that's going to go to foreclosure because making two payments sucks. That's how we dive deep into it. Now, if you apply that framework the same way, we'll talk about like blank land, like 100 acres out in the middle of nowhere. What are the potential motivations or pain points? They could also have inherited it. It could have been in the family generations and the kids don't want to farm it. So now we're going to retire and we don't know what to do. It could be developments come this way and now there's a huge amount of money to be had. And same thing, we don't want to deal with it. We'd rather deploy that into something else. What are the symptoms? They would say, yeah, Jeff, been, you know, farming cotton here for a long time. And uh, you know what? Just, you know, we're, we're just ready to kind of retire to the countryside. Hmm. So again, the framework of creating your sales strategy starts with what are the potential reasons somebody may sell to someone like me? What are the things that they might say that would indicate one of these problems whether pain or gain is happening. And then I line up my questions with that. Okay, so if you want to sell this land, you know, sounds like the kids aren't interested in it. What do you feel like is holding you back from just selling it tomorrow? What's the thing that you're dissatisfied with that I can help with? What is ultimately the hurdle that's blocking you from just getting a million dollar check tomorrow? Well, Jeff, the thing that's really the problem is we got this crop coming up and we don't want to sell it because we don't want to lose it and et cetera. Oh, now we're figuring out issues and obstacles that I can work with. And that's the way I teach it to everybody. Like, look, we're going to focus, obviously, on the single family houses and stuff. Those are where a lot of the examples are. But they also learn the framework so they can apply it anywhere. Paul, you are on with Jeff Smith. What's your question? Uh, Jeff, I really like your doctor analogy. That's that's very helpful. It's um, yeah, it yeah, it's going to be very helpful. Thank you. My question is, say in your example, you're receiving these people are calling you. What about situations when um, you're cold calling or you're door knocking? You're the one initiating the contact, cold. Do you have any um, suggestions, tips, how to get through that first 15 seconds so you get another 30 seconds? Yeah. I mean, th the way that I initiate any con like, have you ever had those phone calls or somebody, hey, Paul, you ever had those yes. phone calls? You know damn well somebody's about to sell you on car insurance or something stupid. <laughs> so I'm not going to do that. Like, it, it annoys me when I get those phone calls. If, you know, if somebody calls just... Hey, Jeff, I'm like, dude, I have no idea who this is. I have no idea what you want. I don't know how long it's going to take. I'm 50-50 on whether or not I'm going to stay on this phone or just hang up. Right. So let's get rid of that idea. I, I already I always hated that concept. So the way I do this, Paul, is whether I'm doing a cold call or door knocking and I do outbound marketing for land. It's like, hey, my name is Jeff. The reason I'm calling is I'm looking for another parcel of land. One to see if you're even open to selling at all. Now, with landowners, they don't get bombarded with nearly as many phone calls. So most of the time, I don't get nasty grams or cussed out or anything. Some of them are like, yeah, I'm open to this. Some people are like, eh, you know, thanks for calling. No, thanks. Okay, fair enough. We're done here. If I'm cold calling a foreclosure or door knocking one, they know why we're showing up. There is no mystery to this. So it's a more about a presentation of, again, what am I there to do? So if I'm door knocking, like, hi. My name is Jeff. The reason I'm here, I understand that the bank is giving you a lot of hard times right now. And I want to know if anybody really took the time to help you through the options. 
that's the way I present it. Mm. I'm not beating around the bush that like, oh, do you have a problem? They know darn well why I'm there. But instead, if I present it in a way of, I understand this is an issue that's happening. And I want to know if anybody really helped you. Now I'm presenting it in a way where they can tell me, they can finally talk with somebody and say, this is what I want. Everyone else is telling me what they want. The buyers are all telling me what they want to do. Nobody's listening to what I want to do. So that's how I change that frame. David Bolton, you're on with Jeff Smith. What's your question? Good afternoon, Jeff. Uh, Jeff, I've got a question for you. Uh, can you recommend any, like I know you, you're offering a course. I, I don't know where to locate that. But would you uh, recommend any books that a person could read along this same subject that that would be guidance for a person? 100%. So there are two books in particular where I gleaned most of my knowledge and deployed from. The first book, and probably everyone's heard of this, is You Can't Learn to Ride a Bike at a Seminar. That's the Sandler System book. Okay. The reason I like the Sandler School of Thought, and I will I'll type in the chat and repeat all of this too. The reason I like the Sandler School of Thought, everybody, is it contemplates the entirety of the sales uh, of the sales process, the sales call, really. Okay. You have your intro, upfront contract, dive into pain, you know, get the offer, fulfillment, and post sale. Okay. Contemplates the whole thing. What I don't love about a lot of things Sandler is, it doesn't really dive a lot into developing questions for that pain compartment. Okay. It doesn't really contemplate how to create questions well. Okay. So you can't teach a kid to ride a bike at a seminar. That's the first book you should read. Okay. The second book and what really helped me develop questions properly is a book called Spin Selling, like spin a wheel, spin selling by a guy named Neil Rackham. This book is essentially a research paper. So if anybody here is like an engineer, scientist type mind, you're going to love this because it's full of charts, graphs. I mean, it really reads like a thesis paper. For any of you all who are more like English, history, and chemistry was just an exercise of pain, you're going to hate every second of this because it, it just is like that. And so this book, David, he, he researched like 30,000 sales calls and appointments. And he started to analyze what was the difference between the people who were very successful with what we term high stake selling, where the impact of making a decision is super high, like buying a stick of bubble gum. If you hate the stick of bubble gum, who cares? You lost a dime. If I, I can strong arm you into buying a cup of Starbucks coffee, even if you hate coffee, you'll still do it. What's the worst that can happen? Five bucks. It's annoying and not the end of the world. I can't strong arm you into buying a Lamborghini. The impact of making a big decision like that is too high. And so Neil Rackham was studying what is the difference between the guys who can really close somebody in a high stakes sale and what's the difference between the guy who, who can't. And his analysis, he was commissioned by this VP of sales. And so he goes back to report to him and the VP says, hey, before you get started, I bet you I know the reason. I bet you it's because their closing techniques are out of this world. Like they read Grant Cardone's Closer Bible and they just crush it at the end. And Neil goes, nope, it's not what they're doing. He goes, okay, well, it's probably rapport, right? These guys have built rapport for, you know, 15, 20 years. They're going out to the bars or playing golf. They, they just, man, they're just the people. And he's like, no, it's not what they're doing. And he goes, well, what the hell are you talking about? He says, the reason your guys are closing so well is that they ask amazing questions. And the VP of sales says, get out. <laughs> this is what happened at the beginning. And so what Neil Rackham realizes, he categorizes the questions into four major categories. This is what the acronym SPIN stands for. And everybody, when I tell you that the, don't think of this as this is the order to ask questions. And it's just the way he categorized them because ordering it a different way would sound weird. But they were called situation, problem, implication and need payoff questions because benefit questions would have made it spib and that would have sounded weird. So that's what he categorized to that. And so this is the research paper that allowed me to create questions that really, really work. Problem questions. What is your concern about the situation? What is the thing you don't like? That is the essence of a problem question. And so what he found was anybody can ask a trivia question, like how many beds and baths that is. All it does is piss off the seller. 
with enough experience, you will learn problem questions. Hey, what is it about this house you really don't like? What is the what is the thing that's really irritating you here that I can help with? People with experience will learn that. What he found was the advanced questions, implication, need payoff, those come with practice. They don't really come naturally. So here's an implication question. You probably all have heard this before. How much is this costing you? Hey, if this situation keeps going, then what's going to happen? Hey, if this foreclosure auction date gets any closer and you can't get any money out of it and your credit's destroyed, then what are you going to do? Those are implication questions. The need payoff questions are things like, hey, if you did sell this house and get some money, what would that allow you to do that you can't right now? If we replace this thing and did these other changes, what would that allow you to do? What improvements would you hope to get? So the study of this was, here's the essence, everyone. Your questions allow you to show by letting the seller come to the conclusion on their own that the cost of doing nothing is so radically high and the benefits of taking action are so radically high as well that it's a no-brainer for them to make the decision to work with you. That is the concept. And yeah. your questions are what do that, not by telling them. And that's what SPIN contemplates. SPIN doesn't yeah. contemplate the entirety of the sales process like Sandler does. That's why I rely on that for that mindset. But when it comes to specific questions and how do I ask them, SPIN is what gives me guidance on that. And that's what I'm coaching. That, that's a huge percentage of, of closing the deal. That's a huge, huge percentage because they're making the decision. They're not, you're not like the car salesman pushing the button to to get the contract written, right? You know, I had a friend of mine that the, this guy, he could sell ice cream to Eskimos. It doesn't matter what he's selling. He could sell like franchises, fencing, swimming pools. The, the, like this guy, you could drop him in a town empty handed. He'd make money in 10 minutes. I mean, he's, he's not a scammer. He's just a great salesman. You know, and and that's a real trait that people have to learn. And he learned it when he was a kid living in hard neighborhoods, right? He learned how to talk to people because he had to survive, right? And um, so that's what triggered my question. I know that this is a key part of of sales, and I wondered, you know, what uh, what kind of uh, information was out there uh, that could complement the topic that we're talking about today. Thank you very much. Yeah. Everybody, David brings up a good point. A lot of people think that sales is just, it's just that kid who's born with it. It's just the kid who grew up in that, and that, that's just what they did. Okay. And so a lot of people say, well, this isn't, this just, you either have it or you don't. Well, where else have you all applied that mindset to? Where else have you all applied that mindset to? And actually you are wrong about it and I can prove it. I can prove it right now that anybody who's thinking that you're wrong. Here's how. How many of you walked into algebra class the first time and said, yeah, you're either born with that or you're not. Yeah. Man, adding <laughs> fractions was hard enough. Now my teacher's saying we're going to add letters together. Something about that sounds suspicious, but you learned it. You may not have been a pro at it, but you learned it. Why is this a skill that we think can't be learned? It can be be learned you just got to put it into motion yeah there you go yeah, yeah. Practice. thank you thanks thank for you. being here thank you so much david appreciate that how many of you guys seen any of jeremy miner's commercials okay if you listen to what he talks about he starts saying, here's my list of 200 some odd questions he'll even break it down every now and then he won't call it problem implication need payoff but if you listen closely he'll name the question and you realize that is exactly what he's coaching. It's the same thing. Identify the problem, show the magnitude of the consequences if it's not addressed, and then show the magnitude of the benefits if it is fixed. He's teaching the same thing. I'm just doing it specifically for real estate investors. There you go. We, we've got those guys, those books, guys, and a whole bunch of other ones on my website uh, for you guys to, to view and partake in. Paul, you are on with Jeff Smith. What's your question, my friend? Okay, yeah, we didn't say too much about actual negotiating. Um, how about any advice about getting them to come up with a, a number first? Yeah. If they're being and, difficult. Right. So, you know, a lot of times this isn't actually as hard as a lot of us think. And so the re here, here's what I mean. The first thing that I do is, I again, I go and start, I diagnose problems, 
right? And I try and figure out what is the motivation? Because if the only thing the person says to me is I'll sell for the right price, nah, man, no problems. I'm just trying to sell for the right price. This is akin to somebody walking in the hospital and is like, hey, man, I'm not actually hurting, but I'm hoping you could hook me up with some good stuff. You got that? You got the good stuff in the back. I just hoping somebody will just do it for me. Like, get the hell out of here, right? So when you find somebody who's truly motivated, it's not that bad. So when I get to the end, I start talking about price. Like, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take all this information you gave me. I'm going to start running some numbers. I got to figure out, you know, I got to figure out what we can do. Just, you know, off the record, just give me a ballpark. Like, what number are you thinking you're hoping to sell this at? And I try and keep it light like that. Okay. Sometimes if they just truly don't have a clue, they're just like, Jeff, look, look, seriously, I don't know real estate. I'm two states away. It's an inherited house. It's a train wreck. I have no idea. If somebody does that, I might throw out low ball offers or anchors just to get them going. Like, okay. Like, look, just to be frank with you, I'm not sure where this is going to land. I mean, if I come back and the guy say this thing's worth 50 grand, like, w w like, are we doing business or what? Like, and I'll do it casually like that. Or, hey, if we hang up and some of the other investor offers you 75 grand, like, what are you telling that guy? And sometimes they'll say, oh, that, that's bull crap. I never take 75 grand. Okay, well, obviously you have some number in mind. Like, just give me something to work with. Help me get started here. I got to tell these guys something, my guys in the back office. I got to tell them something. Or, you know, sometimes like, you know, I, I ask for people's mortgage balances, honestly, and they, they don't have any problem telling it to me. Because again, they think I'm a I'm a doctor at this. So that's typically what I'll do to get a number out of them. If they don't have a number, I'll start throwing out some low anchors because they're not actually based on anything. It just forces a reaction out of them. In the same way, when I'm going after agents, I think of it this way. The agent already tossed out the first number. Like, yeah, we're asking 300000 It doesn't make any sense for me to say, well, what's the best price you'd ask? They're like, I already gave you the first number. You give me your number. Yeah, you know, and I, I was just going to ask really quick on thinking about getting to a price. It's just about getting somebody comfortable with us, right? And it is some amount of rapport, you know, uh, asking family questions, you know, seeing what their pitter patter is. Uh, I know we talk about that in the group all the time, you know, talking about the acronym for family, occupation, recreation, and dreams, trying to get to open them up about something. But, um, and again, you know, getting that numbers back, getting people to open up. Um, but yeah, negotiation. What do you, what do you got for us? What's what are the things we what we might want to look at or think about, not forget, uh, make notes on? Right. Most people, when they hear the word negotiation, they go, "Oh my god, big word, the horror." Right. What a lot of sellers and what a lot of agents forget is that it has to be a good deal for both parties, not just one. Right. It has to be a good deal for us, too. You're not helping anybody if you lose money on deals this is why we say never be a motivated buyer. Don't do this. If you lose a ton of money on one flip, you can't go help anybody, let alone yourself. OK, so when we're getting into negotiation, this is why it's so critical that you have that motivation and problems, because if we're going back to the real estate doctor analogy, Realize that price is not everything to, because of the problems that you're solving. If the problems are significant, the price doesn't matter anymore. And I can, again, I can prove it to you. If I come in with a common cold and the doctor says, hey, man, take some Tylenol and it'll be $100,000 and I can treat you today. None of us are going to take that offer because the magnitude of the problem being solved is simply not worth $100,000. All of us would agree with this, right? If I came in and said, if the doctor said, hey, Jeff, I've diagnosed you, you have stage four lung cancer, you're going to die in a week. For $100,000, I can cure you tomorrow. If I don't have $100,000 in the bank, do you think I will find a way to get it? Oh, yeah. Of course we will, because the significance of the problem is high enough that I am willing to do anything to get it. Now, that being said, not everybody has a problem that is that significant, okay? But again, this is why asking our questions, diagnosing the problem, understanding the implications of inaction and the implications of doing the deal. This is why this is so crucial, because the seller has not gone. The sellers have never 
guys gone through the mental exercise of understanding what the problem is specifically and what happens if they don't do anything about it. They haven't actually done this. You think sometimes, well, well the sellers certainly figured out how much they got to spend on rehab costs and flip and they haven't thought of any of this. So when you show them, there's a guy I was talking with yesterday. He inherited the house. In the beginning of the conversation, he was talking about, well, you know, I might fix it up and rent it. By the end of the conversation, he was like, dude, I want nothing to do with this house anymore. Because I walked him through what he would have to do to get it fixed up and rent ready and the amount of money he'd have to pay and the amount of stuff he'd have to do. And he's like, yeah, dude, you're, you're right. I, I've spoken with some friends. They kind of told me the same thing. This would suck. I want nothing to do with it. Great. Okay. So when I call this guy back eventually and I say, hey, now it's time to do the deal. I'm going to set him up with the idea of I'm here to solve this problem because if I don't solve the problem, you're going to be stuck with it and you're going to have to figure it out. And we have already agreed that this is not a this is not a great option for you. And we know what the consequences are if you don't do anything. OK, so I recap the problems. I tell him what the solutions are, because here, here's the key, guys. This is the key to closing. If you forget everything else I've told you, do not forget this. The reason I can close is because when I bring my solution, it aligns perfectly with the problems I have diagnosed. Just like the doctor. If I say, listen, I got a fever and I got pneumonia, and the doctor says, awesome. What we're going to do to solve this problem is we're going to cut you open and give you a heart transplant. The solution does not line up with the problems. We don't have to be surgeons to know this ain't going to work. Okay. You have to demonstrate that what you're providing completely solves the problems once and for all. So I show that to them first. I go through it and I say, we're going to do all these things. They'll get knocked out. Won't have to worry about it. You don't have to go back to this house anymore. Cut the grass. Do anything if you don't want them to. If you're ready to move forward now, the price we will pay is X. And you wait. And I put my phone on mute frequently. And I let silence do the dirty work. There you go. And once they start responding, then I will do one of two things. I'll either, most of the time, I will hold my ground. They're going to counter with something. They always do. They want the employee discount, right? They look. I know this is a big decision, and I know this is hard, but I also know all the problems that you've been experiencing and recap it again. And I know at this number, I can confidently do the whole thing because I don't want to yank you around, unlike some other yahoos out here who will. And I just stay solid. You have to believe that your number solves the problem. Sometimes they'll say, no, I flat out can't do it. Okay. All right. So, JJ, that's not a number you want to do. Okay. Look, I know this is the number we can 100% take care of this. Obviously, you have something in mind. Why don't you tell me what it is? Mm -hmm. I'm not giving JJ any justification. Did you all hear that? I didn't say, okay, JJ, I understand. Well, maybe I can come up higher. Tell me where you're at. I didn't do any of that. It's just said, obviously, you have something in mind. Why don't you just tell me where you're at? Most of the time, guys, the counter number is not actually based on anything. Most of the time, it's just based on emotion. I got to make sure I got every dime I could out of Jeff. That's all they got to feel. So, all right. So JJ, look, you're at, you're at 120. Our number is 110. Okay. All right, JJ, look, you're at 120. What is the absolute best number you can possibly do? Just, just level with me. We're 10 grand apart. What do we do? And I put the onus on him to do something. Most of the time, they'll come down a few grand. They'll just do it. Like, well, Jeff, 117. You get a few more. Dude, seven is still a little bit. Is there any wiggle room? Nah, Jeff, 117 or nothing. I guarantee you there's more there. All right. Here's what I can do, JJ. I know I, I can't get to 117, but what, here's what I can do. I'm going to go talk with my manager. I'm going to tell him you're on the phone with me. I'm going to tell him that you're ready to go. If I can go squeeze every dime I can out of him, can you meet me halfway at 13, at 113,500? I will get this done for you now. 
but I can only ask this of these guys once. 90% of the time, guys, they'll say yes to that. They just need to feel like they got everything they could out of you. So, okay, I'm going to go ask 113. If I get it, you're signing, right? Right. I put them on hold for like 30 seconds. Don't hang up. Do not hang up under any circumstances because you won't get them back. All right, JJ, it was tough. There's part of me that I can't even believe they went over this. I'm going to send you the DocuSign right now. We're going to go through it together at 1.13. There you go. Okay. Sometimes, guys, it's just it's just haggling. Just putting it out there. Yeah. That's awesome, brother. No, you 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 bring so much value and 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 you're coaching this. I mean, you're teaching this. It's not like you're just throwing it out there one time and people took a couple notes. So obviously um you bring big, great value to the community with your expertise and you polish that up. Hey, I got I got two questions for you. Yeah. Two last questions. If people want to reach out to you, uh, what's the best way to connect with you? Best way to connect with me, guys, is on Instagram. I know everybody wants wants phone numbers, and I know we kind of like social media, the whole thing, but this is the best way to get in touch with me. That's me, jeffsmith.rei. If you're looking on, on watching on YouTube, you know, weeks and months down the line, please follow Jeff on Instagram. Please add to his network. And again, that is the best way to message him. Got one last question for you before we, before we part for uh, some networking. Um, my group's a networking group. I'm teaching the importance of networking all the time, building relationships, how to interact with others, how to market ourselves, how to, you know, initiate conversation, be comfortable with that. All these things play into obviously into to real estate investment and because it's a people business. But we have so many education groups out there like Astro, Clever Investor, Thrive, Sub2, Fortune Builders. There's there's a whole bunch of them out there. Yeah. We have brand new investors coming every single day. Some of them very experienced, some of them with no experience whatsoever. Right. But coming to these education communities, spending thousands to tens of thousands of dollars for an education. They're frequently doing the videos, they're doing the training, the coaching, the YouTube stuff, uh, but not really leveraging social media to be visible to build their network. In your opinion, is, as a successful real estate investor, entrepreneur, business person, coach, what is the importance of networking for the real estate investor today for the success of their business? The importance of networking, guys, is I, I here's the thing. I consistently underestimate this, and here's why I say that. No matter which avenue or product line you choose, whether you're flipping houses or chasing land like me, whether you're chasing multifamily, this, that, and the other, there is going to be some problem that's going to show up either on the seller's part or on your part to actually do the deal. And you don't have all the knowledge to fix all these problems sometimes, or it's too much of a bear for you to take down on your own. You have to know who the people are in your network who can help you take this on. Like if you get a seller who says, "I Jeff, if you, if you get a seller who says, um, JJ, I got 200 acres. It's parked right next to Dallas, Texas. It's great development. I don't know who to talk to. And if JJ has no idea who to talk to, he could literally be losing a million dollars because he didn't know to call me, for example, or call some of the other guys who actually do development. Like these deals are that significant. There's a guy who told me about 300 unit apartment building in Louise. I don't know multifamily. I hate multifamily, but I know people to call. I know the questions to ask so that I can be a part of that deal and help it. Now, here's the other key. That is truly the essence of being a connector. Okay. A lot of people think that being a connector is, well, if I just introduce these two guys together, they'll go make a ton of money and somehow I'll get a kickback. This is stupid. This is not how connections work, right? Connections work either when you bring two massive entities together and they do it, or you're connecting like a buyer and a seller, like you're assigning it. Okay. So part of the essence also is protecting your own, um, your own reputation within your network. So here's what I mean by that. Let's pretend for a second. You guys now know that I do house flips in Houston and you know, I'm trying to take down big land deals in Texas. If you start throwing every house you ever see on the street and every piece of land that anybody says, I'll sell for the right price, I'm going to block you immediately. (laughs) 
And if the opposite were true, think about your for yourselves, everyone, whatever market or product you chase, let's just say you were amazing at custom, custom like multi-million dollar houses in, in LA, okay? And if every time you saw somebody just with a street sign that says for sale by owner and you call JJ every time, at some point he's blocking your number. He's like, this is a waste. Every time this person calls me, it's a waste of my time. So be protective of those relationships. Understand what your network wants before you try and engage with them in a deal. And at the same time, nurture that relationship. Do call them regularly. What are you working on? What's changed in your world? What else are you looking for? I don't have any deals for you yet, but I want to make sure that when that day comes that I know exactly what you want because I'm protecting you from these 20 other stupid things that I heard about that don't match what you're talking about at all. Uh, super annoying. So again, being kind of that doctor to understand what do they want, what do they not want, and then being that filter for them. And then here's what happens, guys. When you do that, there's, there's one of my students, she brought me a couple of leads. They didn't pan out, but both of them were motivated. They're both good quality leads. The numbers just didn't shake out. I have all day to talk with her. Even though they weren't, con that's okay. They were high quality leads, love her for it. She can call me any day of the week she wants. If she had brought me a couple of leads and the person's like, yeah, we'll just sell for the right price, sell her finance and 50% down, like, you all know that. So that is my message. Cool, brother. No, thank you so much. Um, you just brought unbelievable value today. Great tips, great suggestions. I've uh, been really informative. Um, absolutely great call today. Hey, if you guys are watching on YouTube right now, please like just video. Please put in the comment section what your takeaways are, what you found informative, beneficial. We mentioned some books. We mentioned a variety of things. Um, if you have suggestions for me on how I can improve my call, bring in, uh, you know, future guest speakers, uh, someone you'd like to hear, maybe possible topics, put that down on the YouTube in the in the in the uh, comment section. There, we'll do the best we can to um, and improve my product and and uh, bring you continue to bring you guys excellent value in the future. Again, if you want to connect with Jeff, it's going to be on his his Instagram. And again, let me let me share that with you guys. JeffSmith.REI, real estate investor. Uh, messaging him on Instagram is the best way, the preferred way for him for you to reach him. If you want to connect with me, uh, here's my Instagram. There's a link to my website. If you want to register for my group and network with us, guys, you can easily also scan the QR code, go to my website, pulsating register now, you know, gets into the group. So I want to thank all you guys that are watching on YouTube. You guys are on the call. Stick around. We're going to do some live networking, talking, and going a little bit more uh, intimate stuff between those of us that are actually on the call right now. Uh, Jeff, as far as everyone else, we'll see them out there in the world of uh, virtual networking and Instagram and all that kind of stuff, right? Heck yeah. See you guys soon. Thanks for joining us. Look for more Flipside Up. <laughs> <laughs>